Welcome back. We're thrilled to begin panel number two, just focusing on national responses to sexual violence. And I think um, some of the ideas that we've seen in the film are thinking both not only about um, legal responses at the national level, but also thinking about community responses, prevention, and recovering from um, conflict and violence is what we hope to touch on here. Um, thrilled to have the panel here. First, I'll introduce um, the co-facilitator together with me. Uh, Dr. Jelke Boston, who's a senior lecturer at the University of Leeds in the UK. Next to her is Dr. Anne-Marie de Brouwer, who's an associate professor at Tilburg University in the Netherlands. And next to her we have uh, Julissa Mantilla, who is an international advisor on gender and transitional justice, both in Colombia and Peru, um, and is also an advisor to UN Women and was part of the Truth Commission in Peru. Next to her we have Jean Nibuona, who's genius, uh, sorry, Senior Gender Advisor at CARE Burundi, where he coordinates some of their work around engaging men and boys in gender equality. And next to him, we have Dr. Emilio Uvuga, who's a professor at the University of Bulu in Uganda, and has been quite involved in some of the peace processes in Uganda. And last, um, who we're thrilled that she took this at the last moment because a previous panelist was not able to get a visa, is uh, Hosai Wardek. And Ms. Wardek is the USIP Afghanistan senior expert and has worked a lot on peace processes and gender issues in Afghanistan. So thrilled to have all of you here. Um, we're going to start like the previous panel did and ask you to start with a, a five minute presentation of your work. So Anne-Marie, your work has focused a lot on the Gitacha court system in Rwanda and it's particularly how it's responded to sexual violence. I would love to continue to give us an introduction on that. Okay, thank you. I'm very pleased to be here and to be able to speak to you and discuss with you uh, the Gachacha system with regard to, to the sexual violence prosecutions. Uh, I visited Rwanda uh, in different capacities since 2003 and as of that time I've spoken to many survivors uh, of the genocide, survivors of sexual violence and uh, what became clear to me from those discussions is that they felt that they wanted to hear that their stories were heard that their stories were heard that by the world, that their stories were known. Uh, and that made me decide, together with a former colleague of mine, Sandra Karen Chu, to include their testimonials and photos in a book, which is called uh, The Man Who Killed Me. In this book, uh, we included 17 testimonials and photos of survivors of uh, sexual violence, 16 women and one man, and we asked uh, them several uh, questions. Uh, they gave their life story before the genocide, uh, during the genocide, also after the genocide and the problems that they are facing uh, still today. And one of the questions also pertained to the Kachacha proceedings. Um, and we noticed that uh, at that time, uh, these interviews were done in 2008, that they were rather uh, skeptical. Most of them were rather skeptical about the Kachacha uh, proceedings. And, um, in last year, I went back uh, to re-interview uh, these group of people and an additional uh, 13 other people to see uh, whether their views about the potential of Kachacha to achieve justice and reconciliation had actually really changed. And uh, the Kachacha uh, is known as the local court in Rwanda. It's a mix of customary law and the uh, penal uh, state law. And one of its goals is uh, to achieve justice or contribute to justice and reconciliation, to discover the truth and to have the Rwandans uh, do the justice system uh, by themselves. So I re-interviewed uh, these people and a number of other people and I realized that this is not a very a big group uh, to already draw uh, major conclusions of the functioning of uh, Gachacha in terms of uh, sexual violence prosecutions. But I think it does give us some start, some indications of the challenges uh, that were in front of Gachacha and the achievements that Gachacha had for uh, survivors of uh, sexual violence. Well, in total, there were seven, more than 7,000 cases that were dealt before the Gachacha uh, that involved sexual violence. Uh, and um, um, what, what I want to share with you is the experiences, the views of those victims, what they, the survivors, what they have told me last um, uh, January 2012. So it's from their perspective that I want to raise a couple of issues with you today. Gachacha, uh, I must say, was officially closed in June 2012, last year. 
and uh, over one million people have been prosecuted before these courts, a, a total of two million cases. Some people were involved in uh, multiple cases uh, in uh, a little over 10 years time. And we have been talking a lot about uh, no impunity, the idagium of no impunity. But I think if you really look at the situation of Rwanda, you could say that Rwanda is probably the only country that actually lives up to that adagium of no impunity of perpetrators of international crimes because they prosecuted as many people as they could. Um, so a few things that I would like to raise is that from those interviews, I think the results are mixed. Um, but we have to realize that not all the survivors are the same. They have not experienced all the, the, the same kind of situations. They have uh, different personalities. Um, but overall, what I discovered by re-interviewing the, this group of people, that their overall view of Kachacha was positive. But they recognized that Kachacha was also having uh, particular flaws. And I think it's also important to stress here that uh, for many of the survivors, uh, they did not see their cases of sexual violence pursued before uh, the courts. Um, I think I can come back to that also at, at a later stage if uh, Gary allows me to talk a bit about the reasons why not all those cases actually made it to trial. But we also have to uh, recognize that for survivors of sexual violence, they were dealing with lots of different kind of problems. Um, they were severely uh, raped and, and had other experiences of, of, of sexual violence, but they also suffered other crimes. Uh, their families were uh, killed, their husbands were sometimes killed, uh, their children, uh, the houses were destroyed, they did not have any property anymore. They were very sick, 70% of those who survived were HIV uh, positive, so they had also a lot of other concerns to deal with. And Although uh, quite a large number of the people that I, uh, in the end, interviewed actually didn't make it to uh, the Kachacha hearing uh, because of a, a different kind of number. But I think also from the, perspective, from the perspective that they did participate in the Kachacha because of all those other crimes that were committed against them, they could also evaluate and appreciate Kachacha from that perspective. So I mentioned that uh, overall uh, their um, idea of Kachacha was positive, but they also recognized recognize some of the, the flaws. Some of the things that came out of the interviews is that they felt that uh, the truth uh, came out, the truth in the sense to what uh, happened uh, during the genocide, where some of the people that they lost during the, the genocide, where they uh, were uh, buried where they could find them, so they could rebury them. Uh, but of course, not in all of the cases, but in quite a number of cases, they were able to find out what happened and they could give a, a dignified burial to their loved ones. It also brought them, uh, for many people, it brought them emotional relief. Even though it was very, very, very traumatizing, of course, to, to discuss uh, before the Gachacha court, uh, what happened to you in terms of the sexual violence. It was very traumatizing. Many people collapsed. Uh, sometimes they came back the next day or another week, or sometimes they were given some time to, to pause, and then uh, they, they, they started again their, their testimony. But many also said, even though it was traumatizing, it also was part of the healing process, and it helped me actually uh, to... to heal for, uh, to some extent. And it gave me recognition. It gave me recognition in the sense that I had an audience. I had an audience of judges in this case, of the sexual violence case, because these were closed sessions, who were actually listening to me and were, were recognizing what had happened to me. Some of the perpetrators sincerely apologized, but some uh, also did not. Um, some uh, other things that were helpful is that uh, people found out that not all the people that they thought had been implicated in the genocide were actually people who had not done anything. So that will also help them in a way uh, to understand what had happened and that, and that they could uh, in a way live together again uh, with these people. 
some of the other things that came out is that many of the people really found out what were the underlying uh, causes of the genocide. Why did people act as they had done, referring to the bad governmental policy at the time? And most said that although despite some of those flaws, we believed that the proceedings were done in a fair way, and at least we can live together again. And I'm not saying that that is always the case in all of the cases, but they said before uh, the Gachacha hearings, uh, we felt, found it very difficult to, to at least uh, to greet each other on the streets. Now we greet each other on the streets. We sometimes come to each other's rescue. There is intermarriage uh, again. So these are some of the things that they said that, that they felt were positive. But then, of course, they also said there were some really uh, flaws uh, to be mentioned. And they refer to compensation, because compensation was something that was uh, hardly uh, given. If it was given or provided for, then in most of the cases, the accused were too poor to actually uh, pay the compensation. And uh, several of the survivors of sexual violence mentioned that uh, they were very dis dissatisfied with the judges because the judges were sometimes biased, they um, uh, were susceptible to uh, bribery, and they were not properly uh, trained in the field. These judges were uh, lay judges, people from uh, the community that were elected. So for instance, one woman uh, told me about uh, that uh, she was handed over by another woman to a group of rapists. And she made the claim, uh, she wanted this woman to be uh, prosecuted. Um, but the judges said, well, a woman cannot rape. So she was misunderstood in her claim. And there are some other uh, examples to mention as well. So um, overall, uh, there was, it was positive, but they really mentioned that there were also some of the flaws. Um, one, one final thing that I would like to mention, and um, I, I will come back to the procedure and the difficulties for access later. Uh, but sexual violence in Rwanda was recognized as one of the severest crimes. It was recognized as a category one crime as of 1996. So uh, I think that's unprecedented uh, in national laws, also internationally seen, that this was recognized as one of the most severe crimes together with the planners and organizers of uh, the genocide. And this was an unprecedented move, and it also meant that those who were in the end convicted received the highest penalty, life imprisonment. But as one of the people, um, uh, the survivors of the genocide told me, uh, she said, well, I think the fact that perpetrators actually received that life imprisonment coupled with the shame attached to being a rapist uh, many perpetrators in the end did not come forward. So I think that's also something that we really have to think about in terms of uh, effectivity. And um, one more thing is that I would also like to say that there was less attention given to female perpetrators of rape and especially male uh, uh, victims of sexual violence. And uh, although I don't know what the number is before Kachacha in terms of uh, those people that either perpetrated or were victims of uh, those crimes, but it's very clear that those crimes against men and also by women were uh, done in Rwanda. And um, the, the stigma is much higher even for men, I think. Thank you, Emory. Um, we'll shift now to Yulissa. You've been working on these issues in Peru and Colombia. It'd be great to hear an overview of how they've been dealt with in terms of national responses in the two countries. Okay, uh, what I would like to do in these five, uh, five short minutes <laughs> is to try to, to show a comparison between Peru and Colombia. Consider that even though there are different situations and different uh, countries, both are um, countries in trans that have transitional justice mechanisms. In the, in the case of Peru, it was a truth commission from 2001 to 2003. In the case of Colombia, it's even more complicated because it's a current armed conflict but have reparations and a peace negotiation. So it's nothing, if, if you imagine the picture, how, how complicated and how difficult it is to understand, I'd like you to try to think about with a gender perspective and sexual violence. It's even more complicated. So one first conclusion, because I don't want to, to lose the time at the end and not say the conclusion, is that both countries and in both mechanisms, sexual violence was not a priority, gender was not a priority, 
and this has important and very difficult consequences for women, especially when they try to access uh, to justice and to reparations. In the case of Peru, for instance, the Truth Commission was created and sexual violence was not included in the mandate. And this is very, very difficult because after a lot of work with uh, academics and NGOs, the Commission decided to interpret the mandate. There was one clause that said other crimes and human rights violations, so they used that uh, to include sexual violence. And this is a big, big uh, problem because you, the, the, you start wrong your, your work because you send a message. You send a message to victims, to women, and you send a message to the population, and you send a message to the commission inside the commission. This is not that important. Okay, we don't have enough resources, we don't have enough budget, we have to investigate torture, massacres, forced disappearance, and sexual violence, okay, we don't have the leverage. So this is the first, the first problem, um, and I just remember that because the Truth Commission in Brazil was created last year, and it didn't include the sexual violence either, you know? And at that time, you could say that there was not resolution 1820, there was not a special representative for sexual violence, there was not this mechanism that we have now. But even now in Colombia, with all these mechanisms, the situation is very complicated. So um, what we did in Peru was to try to get testimonies, try to read, try to listen, forcing and pushing inside the commission. I have some Peruvian colleagues around who can say that I'm saying the truth and try to include sexual violence. But I want you to, to try to understand how difficult it is for women that they approach to, to, to tell their stories and they think about their husband or their family, and they didn't want to talk about sexual violence, and people in the commission didn't know how to ask. I didn't have the obligation, and the dat database only includes rape, but not all the other forms of sexual violence. So at the end of the day, after these two years, we have these chapters of sexual violence. Um, and some people, when, because I, I have this presentation in many, many countries, may, many people say that we did a lot. But I think that we did a little. This is not the way of working because you have to push for something that should be a right, that it is a right, that should be considered as a right. At the end of the day, the commission uh, found 538 cases of rape, okay? It was a lot if you think that the commission didn't have the mandate to investigate. Um, after that, if you go now to Peru, there was no reparation for victims of sexual violence, and there were only, until October 2012, there were only three cases open. There are no sentences. I'm not talking about a conflict that started in 1980. So the first consequence when you don't think about sexual violence as a crime, and you don't push that in the mandate, and you don't think that it's a priority, is that women are not going to get justice. And if you, you can say, as I said first, well, maybe this was 10 years ago, it's a lot of problems, well, let's go, go back to Colombia. In Colombia, it's different, you know? You have laws, you have the uh, sentence 92, that is important sentence of the Constitutional Court that say that sexual violence is cause for forced displacement. You have sentence about protection and gender. Uh, but even though women and uh, academics and NGOs had to push to put uh, cases of sexual violence as a priority. And I want to, to give you a little example that is very important. Last year, the victims law and land restitution law was passed in Colombia, last year, you know? Well, 2011, and it was a very important law. It was very important, and if you read the law, you can find sexual violence, you can find gender and that. But if you start looking for story of the law, the first draft during the Alvaro Uribe government was, has nothing on gender, nothing at all. After some NGOs, some assessors, some advisors, you and women, women fighting, we, we get to include some articles on gender. This is not the way of working because the message is, is always wrong. But what happened, and I want to tell you this story because I don't know if everybody knows. When the law was about to pass, we have a meeting with the congressman, and as you and women, we were looking for what happened with women victims of sexual violence. And we found out that even though women victims of rape were included, children born after rape were not. So we say, what's going on here? So it was my case to prepare, and I, I say, okay, there's two possibilities. Maybe they didn't want to include children, or maybe they didn't even think about it. 
and as well, the, the situation. We call women's organization, we call activists, we call congressmen, they say, oh, we never thought about that. Okay, we're going to include that. We fight, and we were very happy about that. But listen to that. The first draft say, children and teenagers born after rape will be considered, we, we, we will be getting reparation. Second draft say the same thing. But now, if you look at Article 181 of the law, it says, children and teenagers conceived after rape. It's not the same thing to say born after rape and that conceived after rape. Especially in a country when, when Colombia has a, a sentence on abortion that allow women to get an abortion is a rape. So this is a little word, but it's a whole problem. And this is the consequence when you don't think about gender and sexual violence and women in the draft of the law in the first debate. This is the consequence when you have the law and you start, okay, gender, yes, yes, women, women. What's going on now? First of all, not many people even realize that this is a problem. Yeah? This is the first. And the second, thing, the second circumstances, <laughs> I was talking with victims and, and I asked this question to, to some uh, judges and prosecutors that I give training and they look, what? What are we going to do? What is the consequence? First of all, uh, you can imagine when a woman is raped and she wants to get an abortion, it's very complicated. So now, when she wants to get the abortion, people are saying to them, okay, look, if you get the abortion, you're going to lose the possibility to, to get double reparation because you're a victim and children born after rape as well. There's two reparations. And on the other hand, if I go to a doctor and say, okay, I, w I was raped, I want an abortion, you know, the constitutional court say that I can get an abortion, he's going to say, okay, but this fetus is a victim according to the victim's law and land restitution. So this is one of the main consequences. I have to... Okay, <laughs> this is one of the, this is our only a little example when you don't get gender and sexual violence in the origin of the deal. Okay. John, you've been working in uh, Burundi in the context of, well, both post-conflict and ongoing conflict, particularly around CARES, international development work, economic development, women's empowerment, and engaging men to end violence against women. Tell us about the context and about that work. Okay, thanks. Uh, as you said, I'm working with Care International and my organization uh, is very concerned by this issue of sexual gender-based violence, violence because despite many, uh, many efforts and uh, political willingness, the cases of violence, sexual violence remains many. And uh, the, 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 the numbers of violence are almost high. For example, in 2010, in one region in the West region, uh, one, 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 one center counts 2,454 cases. In 2011, the numbers increased. So, even those numbers are, are almost inexistent because sexual violence remains taboo and the number of women and girls is said to denounce the authors because of shame, the fear of, uh, an, uh, the fear of unstable treatment and the risk of rejection and stigmatization. So the few available numbers are provided by NGOs working uh, for human rights and health. So in order to respond to, uh, to this concern and to support the government's commitments, we bring our input uh, on four levels. The first level is to, to build capacities for women and girls on right skills and to be able to be silenced and to seek for assistance, medical, psycho psychological, and uh, judicial assistance. We also try to build capacities for other community members, uh, like uh, traditional leaders, uh, uh, religious leaders, and also men in the community to bring response, to be able to bring 
the community response to the sexual gender businesses. We also try to develop economic opportunities for women because we are, we, we think and we, we know that the poverty is linked with the violence. Women uh, don't, can't, uh, can't break silence when they are, when they need everything they need, they have to ask to, to, to men. And also sometimes they are victims of the violence because someone wants to help them to meet their essential needs. But our effort, our focus is especially on changing behavior in the community, especially to engage men and boys to bring the response to sexual gender based violence because in our patriarchal system, men are not guilty for any act uh, committed against a woman or a girl because uh, we believe they, people believe in our community that men are the, have the power, and it's true. In our community, men have the power, have the domina, domination, and uh, it's uh, very rare that a man, for example, uh, can be can be uh, the perpetrator. If it's a man, he is protected by his uh, men, by other men, police po police are men, uh, local leaders are men and they want to protect the, the, the men because they, are, they know that is a act of a man and we have to protect that. So one thing is that if we, 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 we can't prove to the men in the community that it's a very important to change behavior, it will be very difficult to, to overcome this issue because the men have the power and if they don't change their mind, it will be very, very difficult to, to address sexual violence. So, every time women uh, have shame to, to denounce the authors because the case will be, for example, amicably settled. They will not be, uh, the perpetrators will be not paid, uh, punished, and if it, uh, Sometimes they said, uh, you have to be married by the, the perpetrator, the author of the violence, and that is the very, very grave. We help men to understand that GBV have negative impacts on their lives as men, also on their children, also on their wives, and to all the, soci the society. So in this struggle, we work with men who understood that sexual violence is uh, harmful for the community and for themselves. And those men who decided to stop any kind of gender-based violences and who tried to help others to, to, uh, to help others to change, those men be our partners for gender equality. So they travel throughout the community, helping others to change their behavior and to understand that the sexual and the gender biases are harmful for themselves, for their children, and or for all the society. Those are the, the role models, men, that we help us to to achieve our our our, our initiative, our commitment, and also we work with local leaders because in our community, many leaders uh, don't want to see people denouncing, denouncing, the, denouncing the, the violence because they, they, they know that uh, this is taboo and it is not good to denounce this. So we tried also to help them to understand that it is better to help other members of the community to, to denounce violence because if it is not denounced, it will be very difficult to, to overcome this. So at the fourth level, we work on the advocacy to uh, help the government and uh, we join other uh, organizations to, 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 to do advocacy for law change and also for, to, to, for implementation. 
because uh, Burundi ratified many international instruments and also there are national instruments that are good, there are laws, but sometimes those laws don't, are not implemented because those who who, uh, uh, who, must, uh, who must implement those laws, sometimes they are also, they, they are in the patriarchal system in the, because the, to, to, uh, to implement laws, this, uh, this, uh, you must have the, you have changed you personally. If not, you will always be victim, you will also always be a victim of the, the, the traditional norms and you will not act as, a, as, a, as an agent of change. Yeah, on the laws there are many big thoughts because now uh, the, we have the, a new penal code that is uh, very effective and that includes many articles that punish violence, uh, uh, sexual, uh, sexual violence. And also we, we are revising the, 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 the family code and also we are working on the procedures of, uh, of implementing uh, gender and based violence law. So, Great. May I um, sum up there? And we can move on to the next speaker. You want, you want to sum up here? Okay, thank you. Sorry, um, I'm going to turn it to Emilio. Wanna, we'll, f we'll finish up and then we'll open up for some questions. So I'm trying to keep, keep us all to our time. Emilio, you've been working on these issues in, uh, in Uganda, particularly in the conflict in the, in the north. Um, how has sexual violence been dealt with in the peace processes in, in Uganda? And where is the national response from your perspective? Before I answer the question directly, let me give you a background. Sure. I am a medical doctor and a psychiatrist. So I hope I will bring to the debate um, additional information and, uh, and also provide a, a different perspective to our understanding of sexual violence. Although the symposium addresses sexual violence against women in conflict, what I would like to say based on my clinical experience and work in the peace process indicates that uh, the concept of sexual violence needs to be broadened. And the broader picture would include domestic violence, violence during conflict, violence in the neighborhood, uh, human trafficking for purposes of sexual gratification or financial reward. So uh, I would like us to look at sexual violence in that broader sense. In that broader sense, sexual violence is very common. And when I say it is very common, what I mean is that it occurs almost on a daily basis, even within ordinary civilian life, in the silent environment of families, in the silent environment of communities. The other thing that I would like us to appreciate is that especially within kinship and family life, sexual violence may be um, perpetrated both by the victim and perpetrator. And there is a symbiotic dynamic relationship between the victim and the perpetrator. And this relationship sometimes is what sustains the, the, the life of the family, the life of the marriage, the life of parents with their children and between children uh, in the same family. Although this is happening, communities and family members are quite silent about it. 
there is a cultural and social uh, conspiracy of silence so that what happened to victims within the family is not revealed. And yet, sexual violence has serious psychological consequences. The psychological pain that victims go through, the shame, restricted and devalued, devalued life, humiliation, and direct death to victims uh, is often reported in the newspapers of our country. The responses at national level in Uganda are quite many. But let me start off with the traditional system from where I come. When I was a little boy, rape was almost unheard of. Whoever committed the act of rape would appear before a tribunal of elders <coughs> in the community. And this tribunal would prosecute within the traditional system. And if the victim is proven guilty, then he would be punished, he would be made to feel ashamed. Just like what the Assistant Secretary General was saying, the, the, the representative. Um, so what she said is probably based on this traditional concept and treatment of rapists. So that is the traditional way of handling rapists. Um, recently, one of our female activists <coughs> and parliamentarian uh, spearheaded the campaign and called for castration of rapists, although nobody has ever been uh, castrated so far. We have a stiff punishment in Uganda, and that is capital punishment. We are a country that nominally now disagree, uh, dis disagrees <coughs> with execution, but once in a while, ex executions still take place, but none has been executed for raping. Um, so with that, I would now like to suggest uh, that in our country, we have, especially I have been concerned and active in the North, in the post-conflict situation, where I have contributed to peace-building efforts at community level, uh, through a project called Forgiveness Project. This Forgiveness Project offers opportunities for people whose rights have been violated, including by rape um, and other forms of violation of individual rights. And we tape recorded this account of people who agreed to provide their experiences. And then at a museum, specially designed muse museum in one of the former camps, people come and listen to the accounts of their colleagues. And then they get inspired to also say, I also have a story spontaneously. And they too provide their stories for us to record and to edit so that clips of voices of up to three minutes are then made. The community then says, but this experience is very good. Why don't you create uh, a mobile clinic, a mobile forgiveness clinic? And so we started taking the museum to the villages. And then they said, but why are we listening to the same voices? Why don't you help us get more? So that is the positive aspect of allowing uh, opportunities for individuals whose lives have been violated to speak out. And when they speak out, the outcome that our community participants say is once one has 
forgiven the violator, one has spoken out. And then one feels free. One feels the burden of psychological pain lift and go away. One has the opportunity to engage in gainful activities. Businesses flourish, interpersonal relationships improve. So our forgiveness project, we think and we are planning to roll it out throughout the post-conflict region of northern Uganda because this pilot activity we carried out in just one sub-county. And then we have had empowerment of uh, communities um, through um, training and adv advocacy because the individuals who provided accounts of forgiveness acted now as um, advocates and the lobbying for forgiveness. And then uh, the other is, uh, I would now like to also say that our government has been quite proactive in promoting the advancement of women. First, they started off with an aff affirmative action for girl children in uh, at Makerere University. They added 1.5 a point of 1.5 to the score, total score that would then allow girls to go on to the university, even though they would have been low uh, or below the cut point for admission. All right, yeah. Emilio, may I? Can we wrap up there? And, uh, and then we'll come back to some, some questions about that. I would wrap up by okay. saying there are a lot of challenges, and I suppose that is where I will probably list them. Okay. When somebody asks, if they, even if they don't, <laughs> <laughs> well, even we will ask they, that. Even if they don't, I will still okay. find another way. Perfect. Um, I'll now turn to Hosai. You've done a lot of work on, particularly the, the law and violence against women in Afghanistan, as well as making it uh, come into play. I mean, that is making it be well implemented. Tell us about the process, including the challenges within. Um, dealing with some conservative elements of Islamic culture and in the backdrop of the conflict. Well, thank you very much. A very good afternoon to everyone. Um, I know that the afternoon sessions are a little bit difficult because after lunch, at least personally to me, it always reminds me of uh, Sunday afternoon nap. So <laughs> I hope we will be able to have everyone with us till the end of the, the panel discussion. Um, well, uh, in Afghanistan, obviously, um, you know, women and uh, violence against women obviously has been making headlines. Um, it's still actually making headlines and every day we are coming up with a new story um, and a new case uh, uh, that are there. Uh, but luckily actually uh, for the past 11 years, civil society has been extremely active to ensure that we get systems and laws in place that we ensure women's rights and actually we prevent violence against women, especially uh, sexual violence against women. Now, I must say a little bit of a background that um, it's very common for Afghanistan that previously these cases of violence, especially marital rape, uh, rape by a member of a family, they were all existing, obviously, but the issue was never spoken about or they never actually, nobody wanted to speak about that one because of the stigma, the discrimination, and as well as the issue of bringing uh, shame to family. Um, the fact that actually that the cases are increasing and every day we have been hearing about one um, actually will have two dimensions to that. First of all, because we don't have a national survey to tell us that really the cases of violence against, against women increase, or that's for the fact that actually people are now much more aware and they would like to come out and speak about the issues very openly, especially when you have a father coming all the way from a province, from a very remote province to Kabul and bringing his 13 or 12 years old daughter who have been raped by the local police um, is showing the carriage that actually families are opening up and they very openly report about these cases. Um, in 2009, um, Afghanistan actually uh, um, enforced violence against women law. Um, obviously, the whole process around that one was not easy. Uh, we, uh, there was a tremendous work that was put in place by the women activists, by the civil society groups, 
that they have to come together and, and talk about it, lobbying at the different level, including uh, some of the religious leaders to get us on board. Some of them, they did not want it to be actually. Um, and I also remember one of the sessions that when we first get the draft of law, and we went to actually a group of parliamentarians and we were presenting it to one of the parliamentary committees, they started criticizing us and bombarding us with so many questions using the religious side of it, which unfortunately, the group of the women activists that they went to argue about that when they did not have enough knowledge to argue with them at that certain point of time. Uh, and I do remember that some of the technical advisors who were present there from the international community were also silent. And when we came out, I remember that I asked one of them and said that we wanted you to contribute into this thing. And then they were like, oh, we didn't have the English copy version of the law, so that's why you didn't contribute it. Um, but in any case, we still went ahead with that. Um, it took us uh, uh, a lot of struggle, as I said. Some of the women activists were threatened for that. Um, some of them were actually even uh, tried to be attacked on, uh, but still we could manage actually to get the law signed by the president. Now, the very good thing about that one was that since the parliament, we were up in the parliamentary elections uh, and the previous session were not authorized, they were just about to convene the second session of the parliament. So the president signed it and in August uh, 1st of 2009, it has been an officially gazetted um, in, uh, as an official law within Afghanistan. Now, so many cases that are actually in the process being used, that law has been used for that. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, not all the judges and the prosecutors within Afghanistan would know about this law and would use it. They would still go back to the very old version of the panel law, uh, uh, the civil law, uh, which actually completely contradicts some of the sections. And the good thing about this law is that it also, among the many other objectives, uh, which is a little bit tricky to me personally, is also actually tackling different issues like practices, traditions, um, and the norms which are actually contributing or as it perceived perceived as, as violence against women. But then it also adds another paragraph which keeps it very open for those who wants to spoil it a little bit that says that even um, actions that are in contrary with, the Islam, with Islam. So that gives a very wide open door for those who would like to manipulate it. Now, what are the weak points uh, about this law is uh, particularly that it's basically focusing on violence against women, uh, but what is normally and very largely practiced within Afghanistan, and I'm glad that one of the, the participants here already mentioned that, is violence, and especially sexual violence against uh, boys and children in Afghanistan. Uh, that is something which is existing and very widespread in the country. Uh, I'm sure those of you have actually read the, the report from the Human Rights Watch. Uh, you would know that very recently a boy was actually put in a juvenile detention center for the fact because he was actually caught having sex with two adults in a public park. Uh, but where those two adults went, God knows, but he ended up being in a detention center and he's only a 13-year-old boy. And for the fact that when they ask him saying that why he, he is in, in detention center, they keep on presenting the reason that, uh, well, because he confessed that he was actually having sex with several other adults as well, so that's why he's, he's being in the detention center. So I really very much like what the doctor mentioned here that, um, you know, we have to look at the issue of sexual gender-based violence beyond the, the, uh, the time of war. You know, in Afghanistan, it has been a very normal practice to have uh, boys as sexual slaves. Um, and that even during, you know, the war, the civil war, that was a sign of power uh, for, for the different commanders um, uh, and, and the warlords at that point of time. Um, and, and the issue is that sometimes this, um, you know, violence against children, <coughs> especially boys, has been, uh, uh, you know, repeated on. And at least for one of the experiences that I, I personally encounter with, with a few colleagues in the, one of the offices that I was working for, and later on when I was speaking to him that why he does that, he said that when I was a child, this is what happened to me. So now when I'm doing it with others, it gives me the, the feeling of power and, and that I'm, I'm able actually to show my masculinity. I'll stop in here because I'd love to hear from others on this and obviously some other questions that we can talk about the risk of the challenges in this area. Thank you. Right, thank you. I'll open with two questions and then Yelka will take over from there. Um, first question to, to Anne-Marie, you've talked about, so the Gachacha court system has ended as of June of last year. Um, what happens next in Rwanda? How do you see that it sets up for uh, holding accountable those who perpetrate even, that is, during the conflict, but certainly after sexual violence? And the other would be kind of what are some of the lingering challenges of cases that were not tried and accountability? So we'd love your thoughts on that. 
Um, true, the, the, the TESRA system has officially ended, but uh, a law was also put in place last year which says that new cases, if there would be new cases would be coming up, that these can be tried before uh, the ordinary court. So, for instance, the sexual violence uh, cases would become uh, before the primary court. Uh, so that is still a possibility. Uh, it's only a recent, so I don't know if there are already some of those cases before. If there are, there will probably be very few. Uh, but if you allow me, I would also still like to say something about the procedure in the sure. et cetera, and the challenges, yeah. if, there is, if there is time, yeah. uh, because I didn't say much uh, about that in the, the first five minutes, um, or maybe it was ten minutes. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but uh, in any case, I'll try to keep this very brief. Um, I didn't mention that originally the sexual violence cases were to be prosecuted before the ordinary court because that was the, the deal for the category one cases. But in 2008, uh, justice for victims of sexual violence, those 7,000 cases were still before the ordinary court. Justice was long overdue and these cases still had to be tried. So then that shift was made to, to take the cases from the ordinary court to the Cachacha court. Uh, to uh, come up with the sp uh, special protection for the victims, special protective measures were implemented uh, before the Kachacha court. For instance, these cases could, uh, were to be dealt in closed sessions, um, but still, that didn't always help so much uh, to, to have uh, no further stigmatization because oftentimes the people in the community knew or they saw the person going uh, to the closed session. But on the other hand, uh, some of the women also said, well, actually I didn't care as well because I was raped in public. Everybody saw that I was raped in public. So people know. Um, so even if it's a closed session, people, people know and I, I will go there anyways. If in case of a breach uh, by a judge to, to talk about the case, this uh, judge would be um, fined or was uh, going to uh, get a sentence of three years as a maximum. And trauma counselors were allowed in the Kachacha sessions uh, when the survivors of sexual violence testified. Uh, this is really still one of the major problems, I think, uh, because there are not enough uh, trauma counselors uh, in Rwanda. There's a lot of trauma, and although, of course, everybody uh, did their best and many people were supported, there is still m very much a need for trauma counselors, I think, and, that, and that's the case in every post-conflict uh, country. And that was also the case uh, for Kachacha. One of the things is that, um, I will wrap up, that now that Kachacha is closed, uh, there has been introduced a, a special victim friendly provision, which uh, says that only a victim of sexual violence can actually lodge a claim, claim now that uh, Kachacha has officially ended. And this is actually to protect the victim because in the past sometimes malicious claims were made by others to further stigmatize uh, victims. Um, there are then many more things to say, also about training the judges. There were trainings for the judges to actually prepare them for uh, these kind of cases. And one uh, final remark, if I may, uh, because what I want to say is that many of the cases of sexual violence didn't get before the Kachacha court. But that also has to do not only with the legal system, but with the fact that many of the victims uh, died. Uh, the perpetrat perpetrators died or they fled. Many of the perpetrators were not known. Their identity was not known because the, the survivors were moving around the country and they um, met with the perpetrators of sexual violence that they did not know. Um, so in that kind of cases, what, what kind of justice do you then provide also to this group of people that can never actually have a trial case? So other, other possibilities we have to think about as well. I'll okay. stick to that. Thank you. John, a question for you. Uh, one of the community-based projects that you coordinate is the Abatangamucho project of men who are reaching out to other men and women as well to hold them accountable to question their use of, of violence. Tell us how that's going. How do men respond to that at the community level? Um, and how do, you think it, how do you think it's working? Okay, thanks. <coughs> I think... I, uh, I can say not only men how they respond to this uh, initiative in the community, but I can say the whole community in general because our previous effort to help women to achieve their rights uh, by implementing so many projects 
but also by targeting women only who didn't uh, didn't have more success because the men were always taken apart at the project and uh, were all, 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 always opposed to the action yeah. taken taken the community. So I think all the whole community appreciates now the, the initiative because it is uh, very inclusive and the men now now challenged and they see that they were, they are part of the solution because you know once men are part of the problem we can uh, we can say that men as uh, sometimes spectators are part of the problem so it is very important to make them part of the solution so i think that this is an uh, an inclusive approach and uh, men appreciate this in the community so it is based on personal testimony because there are men who experience uh, violence and who changed their behavior who now became change of the agent of change now they try to help other men to understand that uh, gender based violence sexual gender based violence all those form of violences are are harmful from for for them and also for the other community so they they help others based on their life of story so they testify the life of story and others are come to listen to them and they they decide to choose a best life a best, a best uh, way of life because uh, they this is based based on self self commitment so if someone is cast and he decide to join the movement because now it's a big movement in the community they they are almost in the whole country they if someone decide to change if they listen to the those abatai mutra and decide to join the movement he's welcome and they give him six months of observation to see that if he's uh, to try to 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 be to be like can i say conform to the the attitudes he no longer beat his wife he no longer commit sexual violence because even in the community in the household you know many women report sexual violence so the the movement is now traveling thought to all the country to help others men to help young boys to help you to, to change behavior and uh, i can say that it's, uh, it's helped a lot in empowering women because also women are appreciate this approach uh, thank you country perspective is a tension between intention on one hand and implementation on the other hand so I would like to ask Lisa first a bit especially because I know that, that you've done trainings with judges and prosecutors and and I would well I was wondering how that how that pre, if is that for you an example of how that tension um, becomes clear many stories about that um, but I would like to start with a, a little story it happened in Peru last year I was given a training to prosecutors and judges so we're talking about sexual violence and women and victims and that and one of the judges raised her hand his hands and say you know what Julissa uh, you know what happened here that many women a big percentage of women lie in order to get revenge for the husbands they lie they made this thing up there's a big percentage and, and after that, okay, and I say, okay, one minute. Okay, you're talking about big percentage. Please, could you tell me which kind of database do you use? Because if you're talking about percentage, you may have statistics and database, and I don't have that, so please. And he say, uh, well, I don't have. So wh why do you say that? Ah, because I met many women like that. So this is the kind of, of things that you think that this is true, you keep repeating and repeating. So if I didn't know anything about gender and say, okay, maybe it's true, but when you know that it's not true, this is a stereotype. So this is a big problem. And I'd like to, to go in this answer with, with what one of you, you, I think, mentioned during the first panel. Why when men and rape, people say, okay, maybe this is that, and what happened, why women? I think that it's very hard to draw the line between sexual violence in conflict and sexual violence in every day. You know, for instance, torture. In the case of Chile, during the dictatorship, a lot of cases of torture. The dictatorship ended, transitional uh, democracy, transitional justice, etc. So there is not torture in this percentage. 
massacres during the armed conflict, no execution. The armed conflict finished, so no execution, no massacres. But what about sexual violence? You have sexual violence in the conflict. You have sexual violence in the street. You have sexual violence yesterday, before, and tomorrow. I would like to do something that I do during my class. I would like to ask women in this place, only women, please raise your hand, women that never suffer sexual aggression. I'm not talking only rape. I'm talking about sexual harassment. I'm talking when molestation, when they touch you in the, in the, in the please raise your hand, women who never suffer that, and I included myself. <coughs> Nobody. And we're more than 100 women. The second question is, how many of us file a complaint? A judicial administrative, one, two, <laughs> three, four, five, that's good, six. But we are talking about 100 women here. So if we didn't, why prosecutors and judges are asking women in the middle of the conflict to go to file a complaint? Why? You know, this is the problem between the theory about the international standard and everything and what happened in reality. Thank you, Yulisa. Couldn't be more clear. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's, let's give you all a chance to, to fire your questions. I'll start at the back and then that way. Uh, oh, sorry, you're sooner there. So we'll start on that side and then go to that side. Three questions at a time. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to say thank you for this session. Thank you for the organizers. Um, I think this um, conference was very useful. My name is Lydia. Oh, dear. <laughs> Uh, my name is Lydia, I'm from Kenya, and I just had a couple of questions. Number one, I wanted to know with regards to witness protection um, in the Gachacha court system, how was that dealt with, especially where the perpetrators were known to the, to the victims themselves, but then of course they were not coming forth. Nobody wants to get prosecuted for sexual violence. Uh, number two, um, this, do uh, this is to Dr. Ovuga. With regards to the psychosocial support which you're talking about um, and the forgiveness project, I would like to know if the government of Uganda was supportive, if they funded it directly, and how exactly you got those policies to be passed by the government. Because in Kenya, where I'm from, we already have so many policies and guidelines and all sorts of things, but the problem is the government still refuses to fund adequately. The mental health, health budget forms less than 1% of the entire health budget for the country. And I'd like to know how you went about it, because I know the Trust Fund for Victims has, for the International Criminal Court, has done a lot of work in Uganda. And for Miss Yulisa, I really like you. <laughs> <laughs> I really like you. Uh, you speak with so much passion. And um, I just wanted to know, even this is to the entire panel also, how is it that we can deal with a government which refuses to publicly acknowledge that sexual violence occurred and they refuse to put in place any credible mechanism starting from investigations to prosecutions. And now civil society is forced to enter into litigation, like for instance, public interest litigation, so that we can force their hand to offer effective remedies to these victims. And this is related to the Kenya post-election violence which occurred in 2007, 2008. Um, thank you. Thank you. Didn't mean actually ask three questions when I said three. <laughs> That's all right. We'll ask two more, two more people asking questions. Hi, um, Millie Lake from the University of Washington. Um, I have a question for Anne Marie, for all the panelists, but for Anne Marie in particular. And um, I think as international advocates for gender, sexual and gender-based violence, we face a difficult trade-off. Um, when faced with trying to strengthen domestic legal systems. And on the one hand, we want to, to support domestic um, lawyers and judges to provide a homegrown, le um, legitimate response to domestic um, sexual and gender-based violence that is really perceived as legitimate by local communities and, um, and uh, truly domestic. And on the other hand, we're we're cautious about providing impartial justice or justice that's perceived to reinforce existing hierarchies of power. So I guess my question to Anne-Marie, but to everybody is, uh, and I think of Rwanda especially when I think of this, and the lack of prosecutions against RPF, um, any RPF troops, is just what you 
what you value more, whether we should work towards increasing legal accountability and increasing criminal trials and criminal prosecutions, even if that comes at the expense of impartial justice and it is really kind of reinforcing certain hierarchies of power within a domestic um, system already, or whether we should, whether such criminal prosecutions are kind of meaningless if they don't, if they don't, if they aren't genuinely impartial and across the board. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. And there was another question on that side, I think. That lady, yep. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Karen Lagengo. I'm from Kenya. I'm an independent consultant. Um, I would also echo Lydia that I really like uh, Ulyssa's um, uh, analogy and the question that she asked, and that's where my question is based from. How can we begin to attack the uh, the gender and cultural considerations that underlie the sexual violence and conflict from a realistic and very complex position? Because a lot of times they are placed in silos. So you're looking at uh, transitional justice mechanisms and uh, like she said you're looking at atrocities the uh, injustices that happened at a national level and not giving that any gender uh, not looking at it from a gender lens and therefore issues of sexual violence will not come out in such processes but also uh, sexual violence is synonymous with uh, uh, what do you call it with women or violence against women sexual violence against women uh, at national levels. So how can we begin to look at the underlying gender considerations? Women take up, bear the consequences of men being violated sexually. And I'll give the example of Kenya. I was the gender advisor to the Commission of Inquiry into the post-election violence. And women would come up and say, my husband was uh, sodomized or his genitals were cut off. They, but they would not say what happened to them. And they would then bear the consequences of the violence that happened to their husbands for a long time to come. There were women who bore uh, children out of uh, uh, the rapes that occurred. Nobody's looking at that dynamic and how the gender uh, um, arrangements in the society have been realigned as a result of the post-election violence. So I just wanted to know how can we begin to look at gender and culture in the very complex way that it should be looked at, as opposed to the simplistic, silonized, if I may use that way that we're doing it now. Thank you very much. Um, Anne Marie, you would you like to comment? I'll keep it very brief. Um, as far as the witness protection uh, question, um, well, what happened actually in the beginning, in the uh, initial phase of the Kachacha, uh, a lot of evidence actually came up of sexual violence. Uh, victims and perpetrators alike actually talked about sexual violence in Gachacha. This was during the information gathering phase and that sometimes actually exposed, uh, of course, the victims and further stigmatized uh, them in case they did not even want that other people actually knew that they had been raped. Then uh, a rule was implemented that which said that in case you wanted to file a, com uh, a complaint against somebody who had raped you, you could do that uh, with one of the judges and the judge had to give your case to the prosecutor and the prosecutor would file the case at the ordinary courts. So that was before uh, 2008 and this rule was implemented in 2004. But then in 2008, um, there, uh, when all the cases went uh, back to uh, Kachacha, the rule was implemented that uh, vi uh, witnesses or survivors had witness uh, protection because they could uh, testify in closed session, so only in front of the judges and when the accused was available, the uh, accused as well. So that was in closed session and uh, what I said in some of the cases, it was very much known uh, that the survivor uh, was a survivor of sexual violence, so people actually still knew <coughs> that, that that case was going on. But what, what was also interesting is that some of the women actually said that they, uh, some, not, not all of course, but they said, I don't really actually care because it, it happened in public and people may know, they know and they may know and I want to have that kind of recognition. So some women actually uh, spoke up uh, already in the early phases uh, before 2004. Thank you. Professor Ovuga, would you like to comment? Yes. Um, <coughs> government did not support our initiative. 
we went into this initiative with uh, researchers from three universities in Denmark, uh, the Southern University of Denmark, Copenhagen University, and Aarhus University. So our activity has been supported by research funds. Uh, related to this and taking it to how do we force government to support or to do things that they otherwise would refuse, here you would need to provide the evidence base and provide the results to government in policy uh, briefs. We are now in the process of preparing policy briefs on the value of forgiveness project. And we have already started engaging district leaders where we carried out the research and they are quite satisfied with our findings because under the research, we also provided data for them for planning in the district. So you have to be strategic and use the opportunities that arise so that you can then uh, ensure that what you want done is then done. The other approach would be community empowerment through uh, radio talk shows, which we have done on the forgiveness project. We also conducted an international conference on peace and peace building in Zulu last year in April. And this was uh, attended by government officials who were part of the plenaries and group discussion. The conference, just like today, was opened by the Assistant Secretary General of UNDP, who flew all over from here, all the way from here to go and open the, this conference. So you have to be strategic and uh, create alliances uh, and then use research results. And hopefully, government will take the, the initiative to, to do what you would like. Thank you. Is this one? Yes, thank you. Thank you for your, your question. I don't have the answer. <laughs> but I, I'll try to, to, to get back together because I think they are related. Um, first of all, when you ask, how to do, the, uh, how to force government to acknowledge your responsibility. I wish I had the answer, but I could say, okay, international jurisprudence, international report, resolution, that's all true. But the other thing that I think is important is to start thinking about what justice for men, what justice for women. I'm talking about justice is not only criminal justice. You know, uh, recently in Colombia, there was a research about women, 2,000 women were uh, participating in, the, in this research. And people have the idea that women never approach to file judicial complaints concerning any kinds of sexual violence, human rights violation. But when we did the research, you say, okay, they didn't approach to file criminal complaints, but they did approach to use any other legal resources for uh, economic and social rights. What they want about, you know, child support and family, this. So justice is not only criminal justice, this is the first thing. The other thing concerning the, the question that you asked is about gender, of course, gender in all the process. Why? Because many people, many times we talk about, okay, gender, we have to work with prosecutors, we have to work with, work with judges, training that. Okay, when a woman approached to a legal, I don't know, to a judge, uh, judge's office, who is the first person that he met? He doesn't, he, she doesn't meet the judge. She met the security guard. This is the first person when the women have to knock the door. So we're thinking about judges and prosecutors, so we start thinking about security guards to tell them, you know, when a woman approach, you are not to say, okay, the rape is one. Because they used to say so. You had to think, okay, this is my work, I had to do that and that and that. We didn't think about it. Another example that they use with the prosecutors in Colombia. Uh, I, I use this example because I was in a workshop and one prosecutor raised his hand and he said to his colleague, Okay, listen, he said. Um, last time, a woman came to my office with, ch with uh, her children. And law say that children couldn't be allowed in a prosecutor office. So I didn't allow the children, so she left. 
And another prosecutor say, no, but why? You should have done, uh, you allowed them all together. Another one say, no, 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 when this happened to me, I took all the children together, so one woman take care of them, go to talk to me, the other woman tell. And at the end of the day, I asked to them, what the law said. The law said that children are not allowed in the prosecution. So if you follow the law, children shouldn't be there. But if you're talking about sexual violence in conflict where husband dies, women have to go with children. So you, start to, you have to start thinking, and this is the way of gender, to start thinking criminal law and criminal institution and legal institution with a different uh, situation. In the case of Colombia, for instance, now, there is judges for land restitution. And last time I was in a work group with them, and they have one week with constitutional law, international law, labor law, all the law. And two hours on Saturday for gender, in Santa Marta, no, near the beach. Two hours in the morning with gender. And the last, you know, when everybody left, okay. So we're talking about that, and I asked them this example. And I told them, did you realize that since in this conflict, most of men have died, and women are the people who are approached to you. Do you know how to treat them? I say, oh my God, we didn't, you know? This is the thing, to start thinking in different ways. And finally, one example from Peru. Uh, some years ago, after the commission, there was these cases in Manta and Vilca, that were very uh, poor towns in Peru. And when the commission released, uh, the truth commission, you know, released the cases, many NGOs and many people approached to Manta. Everybody want to research, they want to, everybody want to file complaints. And the community feel resented, that they say, what are you coming? We don't want you to, do, we don't want people to know as the rapist community, as the victims of rape. We don't want that. We don't want any with, with prosecution. But in other town in Peru, that women were raped, women filed complaints, and when the NGOs, it was a prode, and NGOs explained to them, okay, maybe you are going to lose, you know, status of limitation, there is not evidence. They say, we don't care. We want prosecution, because even we lose, we want the community to know that this is not our fault. So it's the same criminal proceedings, victims of sexual violence, but justice is different for women and for different women as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, that's great. Do we have uh, questions on Burundi and Afghanistan? Torum, in the middle there? And then, the, then after you give it to the gentleman next to you, who also has a question. Uh, hello, um, I'm Turun Lindelman from CMI in Norway, the research institution. Um, I have a question on Afghanistan. Um, uh, there's been a lot of controversy over customary justice mechanisms in recent years. Um, and the uh, United States Initiatives was at the forefront of an initiative to give them legal status. Um, a lot of the women who was involved in the EVA law, the law against violence against the women, were against this, saying that um, it undermined the formal system, it was uh, against women's and children's rights. Uh, so I wonder, um, uh, Mrs. Sosai, if you see a tension here, what's your position on this issue? Yeah, this gentleman. Um. Me or? Yes, yes. Oh, sorry. Yes, you had your hand up, didn't you? Either of you. All right. Sorry. Okay, okay. Well, um, I wanted to ask Jean. Um, there's, a, there's some women in Burundi who are advocating, it's a group of, um, group of women who are advocating f uh, legalization of um, polygamy. And this has been a big issue among the activists. How can women who we were thinking they are on our side um, and the advocating that? The argument is uh, some of women are saying, look, we were born, we were born out of the, uh, the deadlock, you know? And legally, we were, in Burundi, we are not recognized as children because, you know, our mother has taken wives and so on. So we need government to take consideration with that. And I'm wondering whether you can say something on what your view, what are the... Uh, whether you know that, but it's something that is happening in the in Burundi society. Did the gentleman hi yeah. Uh, I, one my colleague from Burundi, Care Burundi, I just want to know if they are doing any work on the issue of law because experiences have proven from Sierra Leone that uh, most often when these cases are taken to court, these violence against women cases, 
and the issues are practically visible, but they are not provisioned by the law. There is no specific law that goes with it. For example, in Sierra Leone before now, they used to put it under unlawful kind of knowledge. Until very recently, the National Committee of GBV and other key actors will push hard. And before the November elections, we now have a new sexual offenses bill, which caters for that. So those have been some of the loopholes that even though the NGO, the parastatal, the functionaries we do, but before the law interpreting body, if it is not provisioned, then the perpetrator is going to escape. That opens a wound of an escape for them. So I, I would like to know if they are doing anything so as to narrow up the gap between uh, prosecuting and having, holding the perpetrator accountable by law. Because if it is not provisioned in the national law, there is no gender law, no sexual offenses law. I wonder where you'll be heading for, because a lot of them will be going, or the case will be thrown out of court. So please, I, I don't know for sure, but I would like to know something about that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. There's another question here. There actually is. Okay, I'm going to ask three questions on this side to the brief, and then we'll give the, uh, the panelists to respond here. Um, Pia Peters from the World Bank. For Jean from Care Burundi, just quickly, you're working on trying to, be, to change behaviors from man to achieve having less violence against women. What are your key two challenges that you're encountering? And I actually would like to ask the same question for Uganda to Professor Emilio. What are you two challenges, which I know you wanted to say, in on working uh, against violence in northern Uganda? Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Kim? Hi, I'm Kim Tweetsy-Lander from the Human Rights Center at the University of California, Berkeley. Very quickly, um, and this is a little outside the box of the panel, but I was hoping we could tie panel two a little bit to panel one um, and ask about the relationship between international responses and national responses, specifically with the promising new initiative from the UK, which we you know, look forward to hearing more detail about. What, in your experience or your thoughts, might be the relationship or the impact of international intervention in sexual violence and conflict and the national mechanisms and sustainability of the national mechanisms you mentioned. Thanks. Thank you. And just to build off of that, so I'm, my name is Aruj. I'm coming from Citizenship Immigration Canada, and we work in, in the work that I'm doing right now, we work a lot with refugee resettlement and the post-conflict issues that we're dealing with in terms of the PTSD that they're dealing with and the domestic violence that's occurring as a result. So that's the relation, but I wanted to just share a little bit. I have worked in, oh, sure. Okay, so I've, worked, I've done a little bit of work in Pakistan, and one of the things that we did to legitimate and get the buy-in from the community was to use Islam for an ex as an example and, and get the leadership sort of buy-in and the community buy-in on using the rights accorded to the women in Islam to engage the community in dealing with the violence and identifying with it. My question, I guess, is bouncing off of the last one. Um, how do you go from the international to the national to the community? And the story that, I guess, just to add to my experience that I had over there, in terms of the legitimacy in the community to not shame the victims, and the legitimacy in the community to go and then support those seeking justice, um, is often, I think, a challenge as well. And the story I'll add, you know, even from a family member I heard, you know, um, there was a case of Muftara Mai, which became really, really famous around the world. She was in Time magazine, and she was seeking justice. And even around me, I would get family members saying, you know, why does she think that anyone's going to listen to her? Why does she think that there would be any justice accorded to her? She's just another woman dealing with the everyday issues everyone deals with. So I guess the question is, how do you engage? So, for example, in Colombia, how do you get the women to a point where they feel they can have legitimate... Um, you know, justice accorded to them because they have had that. How do you get the community to to also support it so that there's a forum where, or a safe space? Thank you. That's great. Rosai, would you like to? Um, thank you very much, actually. I'll, 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 uh, I'll start, actually, with the... Uh, before I answer your question in terms of the customary law, 
just one thing that actually friends here mentioned about the psychosocial support. Um, I think the very best idea that what we did in Afghanistan was to inclusion of um, inclusion of psychosocial support in the HIC package of health services. Now it also did not come out that easily because the government was using the same agenda saying we don't have sufficient funds, but that's why actually we went ahead to get fundings from the rest of the organizations such as UNFPA, Caritas, Germany, and others to start, you know, once you create uh, demand on the ground, then, you know, we gradually left it for ministry in a way that we said that, okay, now you know that how many people actually need this. They are coming to you with, with, with a request for services. And obviously they could not, you know, kind of shut the whole program just in, in, in the middle. So, and we also connected it with the rest of other issues that they wanted to pretty much were involved like fistula. Um, and, you know, kind of, you know, psychosocial support for the fistula patient. So that, you know, with one shot, we were able to tackle several issues um, on the ground. With the issue of customer, you know, I must say that this is still very controversial. And frankly speaking, even among the women activists, it has a very different uh, uh, approach to this. Um, I know USIP was involved, so were the different, you know, organization at that point of time. One of the concerns that I have is that, you know, Afghanistan is a very closed society. For example, if I have an issue within my family, the ultimate, you know, uh, issue would be that I have to solve it within my own family calling on the elders and actually bringing them on board to say that we have to uh, solve this issue. Now, sometimes, you know, the consequences of those kind of, you know, uh, uh, um, gatherings is that they have to exchange women to settle disputes, and they are there. So therefore, you know, the suggestion that the rest of the group were have saying that, you know, we cannot eliminate a tradition which has been existing for many, many years and for a generation, and we can even, that's what I keep on actually even was talking to three friends last night, is that it's actually an Afghan blood. You know, even if you want to go and interfere, they are like, well, I don't want to discuss my issue with you, so why are you here? We just want to do it internally. So in order actually for you not to be totally shut off and not be allowed to go in there, how is it that we gradually actually interfere in that whole process? Be friends at the beginning in a way, but in a certain period of time, we have to make them saying, okay, you know what? There will be a national conference where all of them will come and say that no woman will be a victim of exchanging your, or will be exchanged for settling disputes. So this is a work that should be gradually done. You know, we, we cannot say that we don't have to either recognize them at this point of time, and we can also not say that, okay, we have to completely dismiss this practice. It's not possible. It is there existing in the communities, whether we like it or not. And the second issue is that, you know, the government is not able to provide formal justice system in communities. So that's the only option available for people to go and to reach. And even the formal justice system is so corrupt that people do not even want to go and approach them. For example, the, the, if there's a case of violence against women or a rape, you know, first of all, if a woman would go, the police who's actually standing uh, 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 there, he will be like, are you a good woman to come and report this case? Because a good woman will not do uh, come and report. That starts right from the main gate. Then she goes inside and then she's being asked questions which are completely hilarious. Uh, for example, two very young girls of both 11 and 12 were raped, and you know, it was interesting because they were showing it in camera, in the national TV, everybody's sitting over there, and then she's like, oh, did he rape you? What did he do? You know, did he took off your clothes? You know, those young girls were just standing in front of so many people on the national TV and have to answer all these questions. So with, with the customary law, there is a problem. They are exchanging women to settle disputes, you know, there's no monitoring mechanism from the national thing, but that's the only option available for some of the communities because there's no uh, uh, formal mechanism. So there should be obviously an intervention that has to be made in order to kind of reform it, and as well as to have an exit strategy for it. Uh, so that's an important thing. That's why I keep on saying it, you know, when we talk about gender mainstreaming, when we talk about, you know, elimination of sexual violence, it's not about revolution. We cannot do it overnight because it will not be sustainable. It's about a process. Uh, so that's the kind of you know, fight that we are having even you know, among the, um, uh, the women activists on that. With regard to, uh, to uh, cultural practices and how to use uh, religion, I think you know, I, I, th there are issues in Afghanistan which are considered extremely taboo. For example, talking about issues of, of uh, you know, uh, violence against children or boys in terms of using them as sexual slaves or the practice which they call it bachabazi. That's not something that they, you know, it took me struggle with my UN colleagues to put that in the form as one of the main causes of violence against women. 
And then they were like, how come that's a cause? You know, that's a kind of a problem with uh, for contributing to violence against women. And I was like, imagine a woman is first of all not getting any emotional satisfaction from the husband. She has to wash her husband's clothes and two or three other boys that he's keeping. So whenever she raises her voice, she's beaten up. Her, they will take out her nail, whatever sort of things they would do to it. So for the woman, when she comes and reports it, she would never say that was the main case. She would say, my husband beat me, while the issue is completely something else. So honestly speaking, even it took a lot of struggle with the international community within Afghanistan to first of all recognize this issue. In terms of using you know, a religious approach to it, I am completely into that. Partnering with men and boys is the only solution when I see it in a country like Afghanistan, because no matter how many times you will come and tell me that this is my rights, I have to do this, you know, the um, international uh, law says this, the national law says this, even my religion says this. If I go back home and my husband would not allow me to practice it, it's a kind of double bookkeeping. You know, it's, it's like almost I will suffer more than I used to be before because at that time I didn't know what my rights were. Now I know what are they. So therefore, it's pretty much important how you package your messages. For example, we were doing a campaign on issues of, of uh, family planning. Now, this is a very controversial issue, even within Islam in any country, you know, forget about Afghanistan. We never called it actually that. We said healthy family, fortune society. It's a very basic name. I mean, when I first started, you know, discussing this concept paper, you know, you would see, you know, friends, you know, giggling at the corner and all that, but that's fine. You know, when you go and talk to communities about birth spacing, you just don't go that. You say mother's health, because mother is such a well-respected, you know, figure within families. And when you talk about, you know, domestic violence, you just go back and say, you know, healthy family relations from Islamic perspective. You know, that's the kind of message you want to get. Obviously, you want to have those religious leaders on board. It took us actually, first of all, to to go, you know, to make some of the religious leaders to go to a filter section with us. You know, first of all, because not all of them were knowledgeable about religion itself. You know, some of them they were not even able to read and write. You know, um, it's very. I mean, they are still very close to my heart for the fact that I work with them in 17 provinces. But it's always, I always believe that how can you use, you know, the culturally sensitive approaches that you can package your message in a way that it's acceptable to communities. When you go directly to them with all these issues, they will definitely be having backlash. Okay. John, would you like to comment? Okay. I think, yeah. So, okay, yeah. so, so this is basically uh, the wrap up as well. So <laughs> if there's anything else that you want to add, for example, about the international yeah, national, then you're welcome to make those comments. Yeah, polygamy in Burundi is not legal, but sometimes, you know, when some men have a good harvest, they decide to, to, to marry another woman because they know that the, 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 the law is not clear about that. They have just to pay 10,000 of a man. It's around uh, $5. And it is not, uh, so I, I can say that the, the, now the law is not clear about that, but sometimes it is done. What we ask to the, 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 the man, if the first woman is not legal, also they ask him, him to choose one, one woman be, between those two women. One, one, so it's very difficult because the first woman, for example, who work a lot for the, the household is a chief. This is very, very difficult. That is why we are now working on the, the family codes. So to try to improve the family codes. So, uh, <coughs> Uh, I think the, the, the answer is also available for the for my colleague from Sierra Leone. Yeah, we, we know that the, now the procedures is very hard and is very long. So we are trying uh, now. We what we are working on is to try to to help just the, just to have to have the the process to be very very short in case of rape because also in our country we ask for for evidence, the whiteness, so many, many things to, for the, to judge the case of rape. So <coughs> it is very important to advocate, to advocate in this case to try to have uh, very clear laws. I think it is possible. So the key for change, the key for change is based on evidence. Yeah, because what we try, you know many times we go to the community to build capacity, to teach community. But uh, in the community, people 
are not uh, very supportive to 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 answer to our 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 word what we are saying. But when it is someone who is based in the community, who have the same uh, the same life, and who decide to change, and someone is observing how he improve his situation, his status, economic status, a social status, every everything. Whilst is someone who it is related to, he can decide to to to, to do the same because he he observe he observe how he, how he changed before how he changed uh, beginning to the to the first step. So as he is related to him, it's a kind of uh, example, a good example, a model of. So it is easy to 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 change when you see. Uh, how someone changed. Yeah, this is the the the, the, the key. There is anything else. We don't uh, we don't use uh, uh, modules or other things, very special things. So that to observe and to relate to the colleagues. Thank you, Jonathan. Yeah. I think, uh, Bobby, would you like to make a last comment for Valerie? Yes, I would like to respond to the World Bank lady and also sum up. Um, <laughs> the main challenge, there are quite many, but I would like to highlight just about two. The laws, several laws and policies that have been enacted in Uganda are difficult to implement because of flaws, weaknesses, and contradictions. Um, the other challenge is uh, victims of sexual violence quite often go back to the police or to the court to retract their complaints because they say so and so is the one that is supporting me and my children, so release him. So the same victims are the same ones who go and retract their complaints. Then the international and national uh, relations here what I would say is that normally the international organizations support the local or national organizations to advance the, the objectives of promoting uh, the rights of women or the rights of men and boys who are also violated. The problem here is that the international organizations based, say, in the US or in Europe have values which are very different from the values of the people in the South. And I can give you two examples. The local people of Uganda said they didn't want Joseph Kony and his commanders not to go to, Hague, to the Hague but that government should establish uh, a Ugandan ICC. This was done, but as I said earlier, there were several contradictions and weaknesses. So the, that particular court section of our Supreme Court has not started its work. The other is cultural practices. Uh, here I am referring to female genital mutilation. The law is clear. Medical experts have given the downside of female genital mutilation. But the cultural practitioners and the culture or the ethnic group where it is practiced say, as a woman you are, you stand upright as a woman when you are mutilated. So you can see sometimes there are contradictions, there are difficulties, and those are the main challenges mm -hmm. here. Thank you very much. I think we have more or less just 30 seconds left. <laughs> um, do you want to briefly um, say something as well? I, I want to add one thing. I, I, I want to, one thing that I would like to highlight that and I'm sure you have noticed it in the panel discussions as well, that you have different countries, countries where they're struggling with the issues of gender in, the, in laws,
countries that you think that they are having wonderful laws, but they, there's, there's always the issue with implementation. And beyond implementation, mm. there is an issue of monitoring. You know, what are happening with those laws? What are happening with those practices which are there? So therefore, you know, the suggestions and the closing remarks I would be having from my side is that we have to work beyond actually, you know, having a law, wonderful law, getting it signed by the president or getting it passed from the parliament doesn't really mean that work is done. You know, we have to roll down our sleeves and we said, okay, things are done, let's go away. But you know, the important part is, is that do we have a monitoring mechanism on the implementation of those laws? I think those are, are excellent thoughts to take with us uh, for the rest of the afternoon and lots to think about still. Kathleen. And thanking our moderators and our fabulous panel. It's terribly frustrating to want to say so much, and we know how much you want to say as well. And this is, we're, we're doing the best we can in a very uh, dynamic session. We have about 25 minutes, and this is the moment we'd like to take a group shot. If you could follow our leader up there, Fitz, raise your hand. We will do it. Leave your books. Leave everything. There will be a break until 4 o'clock when we'll return uh, for our keynote talk with Jody Williams. Thank, Thank you again. Nice job, all. That was Thank a lot. You. Thank you, people.